Hey, today is August 21st, 2017. It's Eclipse Day! And you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 54. We have a few stories about accessibility, laws relating to cell phone data, and more out of the future of autonomous vehicles. If you put Human Factors Cast over your eyes, we're the only podcast you can stare directly at the sun at during the eclipse. So let's go ahead and start this thing. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnstorf over there. Oh, happy Monday, everybody. It's good to be back with a mic and a giant monitor. Nick, there he is. How are is. you, man? Oh, man, I'm doing well. It's Eclipse Day, man. Did you go out and see it? Uh, I didn't. I watched a stream of it earlier because I missed it, uh, but no, I didn't see it. I got a bunch of pictures about it, that's for sure, from everybody and their mother today. What about you? Did you check it out? You know, I did, and uh, it wasn't It wasn't really all that great. No? Nah. I. Uh, so, I mean, it was cool, right? I, I So... I was watching Star Talk, or I was listening to Star Talk rather, and they were talking about how uh, you know as the sun kind of go. Uh, uh, let me let me back up. So I wasn't in the zone of totality. And uh, okay, all right, all right, we can cut the music. All right, I just wanted to play that. But anyway, I wasn't in the zone of totality, obviously being here in San Diego. But what I did see uh, was the sun, and we had the glasses right, so everybody looked up and we saw the. It was partially covered. And it was less impressive than I was expecting. But I was listening to Star Talk, and they were saying, you know, it's something really impressive when you are in the zone of totality because, you know, moments before, you can see the shadow coming in. You can see the shadows on the ground start to sharpen because it becomes more like a spotlight. And, uh, you know, once you're in that thing, apparently you can see the stars during the middle of the day because there's no ambient light, right? No one has their lights on during the day. So you can see the stars, like, right there. So, uh, you know, I'll be chasing that in 2024. Yeah, me and you both, because it looked incredible from people that were actually in the zone of totality like you were talking about, but I didn't catch it. I'll have to wait till 2024. At least it's not 100 years away, right? Right, right. And, well, the one in 2024 is going to be a little bit longer than this one as well, just because the moon will be closer. So, uh, and the sun, the Earth will be far further away from the sun, which makes it a longer duration, which is cool. I'm down with that. You and me both. All good things to come. So what's up with you, man? Okay. So, Nick, I know last week I was a little bit of a grouch in the banter, but I think I'm going to have to do it again. Oh, no. Okay. I know. It's okay, man. All right. This is your platform. Yeah, yeah. This is this is going to be a little silly. So over the weekend, I volunteered at like a startup event called Connect All in San Diego. Uh, Just like help run a booth for a local uh, startup nonprofit that gets people involved in the community. And one thing I noticed is that on their, in order to get volunteers to easily sign up, what they had done is to like put out actual QR codes all over the place. So they'd use that as kind of their advertising, like just take, just like, hey, take a picture of the QR code. It'll sign you up to be a volunteer for organization. You'll get our newsletter, all sorts of great things, right? Well, sure. kind of. Uh, so, Nick, have you ever used QR codes, or do you still use them is probably a better question? Oh, man, I've used them from time to time, but it's not something that is like my go-to method of obtaining information. A hundred percent. That makes a whole lot of sense, man. And the one gripe I had over the weekend with it was it required most people to actually have some sort of downloaded application to actually read the QR code. And that just, to me, like in this day and age, you've got it's hard enough to get people to actually want to download an app and take up the space on their phone and if it's just like a one-time use like this because i personally have not used qr codes in a very long time so that was that was something we were trying to figure out is how do we get around this like barrier to having people sign up and not just having them write it down because i don't know if you've ever like had people write their email addresses but you're always chancing whether it's going to be legible and you're trying to talk to them so it was just a serious barrier to entry as far as getting a bunch of people together trying to just use qr codes and you know what you know what the new qr code is man like this uh snapchat thing have you seen you know yeah that's what somebody brought up was that we should just use that because it's it's so popular right now and we'll have like a bunch of these kind of like mixers over the next couple of months uh so that's that's definitely an option i haven't really used snapchat so i didn't know what they were going on about do you know more about it 
Uh, no, not too much. So I was actually at a fast food place, and they one of their drinks that they gave uh, actually had a Snapchat sort of icon on it, and it said "Snap this for a reward" or something. I don't know, but uh, I think I think the problem with this, or at least what I'm hearing you articulate, is that there's a lack of ubiquity when it comes to QR code readers, right? So like if you had an app on your phone that was built into every phone, or if you could just passively hold your phone up to something and it's always scanning for QR codes, kind of like Alexa's always listening, you know, I think that might be um, a a decent halfway solution. I think there's got to be a better thing, right? So like if if you're taking a picture and your phone automatically detects a QR code, it could bring it up, right? Yeah, I mean, it could um, if you have an app on your phone that it can go and grab. But I mean, we, we were, I was trying it because I was like, oh, well, there's got to be something that is at least either built into an iPhone or an Android. And so me and a couple other people tried it. And of course, you had to download something to use it. But so there's a second part to this that makes it a little bit worse for me anyway. OK, and that's that like a lot. A lot of people use iPhones. I don't really know what the ratio is between how many people are Android or how many people use an iPhone. But for, let's say, seven out of or out of seven volunteers, all five of us had iPhones, right? Um, sure. Except for two guys. So a lot of them, and I don't really know why, but they have they kept Safari as their native browser on their phone. Again, maybe you don't want to take up the space downlink Chrome, whatever your reasoning. Well, unfortunately, the uh, the QR what the QR code did is it would lead you to basically a sign up sheet through Google Docs, uh, just like a hmm. Google spreadsheet. Well, in order to access it, you have to pr- prove that you're not a computer, of course, which is a normal thing. You use like recapture, either pick some images or type in a like a goofy set of characters. Right. Well, in this case, because it was a it was like Google spreadsheets, it didn't support Safari. So now we're getting in two points of entry where we're trying to just have people sign up quickly, where if you don't have a QR code reader, you're in trouble. And if you're using an iPhone and don't have a separate non-native browser you're also in trouble so it was just kind of like a pain with different types of technologies and they're a bit like it's just like a small thing but this kind of like leads people not to want to volunteer or take the time or stand around that kind of stuff sure yeah no i understand that frustration man like i've i've always been a proponent of the less barriers to entry the better right because the high the the bigger your barriers the less people you're going to get through. And especially if you're looking for something where people are trying to volunteer, like you want to make that as easy as possible. Oh yeah. And I mean, we're not, it's not just like any, any type of person too. It's like people that want to help startup companies get investors or who want to give them a, like advice on running the company or getting it off the ground. So there was like a lot of different kind of high level people that wanted to volunteer and become a part of the organization. And we were just having to rely on basically taking their name and making sure that we had their email and everything right and trying to connect them on LinkedIn. But it was a bummer that both the QR code and like these little support issues for Safari were kind of getting in the way. But you also don't, you can't like improve if you don't really try things out right right now i have to ask how did this event go was the event itself okay it was just kind of held back by this event this uh qr code thing uh no it was fine i mean it was just basically showcasing different startups in san diego right so it was actually actually contained a lot of drone tech booths which was really awesome to go around and talk to the guys but no i mean it was fine we ended up basically just manually taking people's email addresses and putting it in ourselves so we got the old-fashioned way yeah yeah (laughs) Well, that's uh, but cool. no, it was great. It was a good time. It was just some technology problems that I noticed while I was there. Well, that's cool. Maybe maybe we should start like uh, letting our listeners know of some of these events upcoming, so that way they're uh, they're kind of prepared for you know just just stuff that's going on in the community. I I don't know, like maybe national level stuff. That'd be kind of cool. You know, that might be a great idea. Some more stuff for our social. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, speaking of that, we're we're gonna be at HFES. Well, I don't know. Blake, are you are you still planning on going? Or is it still I'm still up in planning the on going, yeah. It's okay. not concrete, but I'm planning on driving myself there and being there. Excellent. I am going to be there. I'm going to be uh, chairing a session, virtual environments, uh, session one. <laughs> Obviously, I've done my research. I still got a month or so. I still got, a, I still got time. It's okay. Anyway, well, yeah. Got plenty of time. When's it? It's not till October, uh, right? Yeah, beginning of October. And if, if you guys are there, please, please track us down and say hi. We would love to hear from you. We always love hearing from fans and listeners. 
because there are some listeners who are not fans. Apparently, I don't know. Why would you listen to the show if you're not a fan? Anyway, we love hearing from you guys because it always reminds us why we're doing this week to week. And, uh, you know, you'll know exactly where I will be. And uh, hopefully Blake will be there. And, uh, you know, uh, after this virtual environments technical group uh session you can meet and greet with us and and it'll be a great time so so please feel free don't don't hesitate to like come up and say hi to us we are we are pretty uh pretty approachable i would say yep just two nice guys for sure (laughs) two nice guys all right man so before we get into the news this week which is actually pretty light but i want to get into this man so when was the last time you opened a comic book uh what was it sunday night Wow, that was a lot more recent than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, I've only recently got back into like picking them up at local comic book shops and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, okay, so how long has it been since you've opened one? So I just opened up one the other night. And uh, I got to say, man, I, w- I was having a conversation with one of our colleagues who's been on the show before, Woodrow, uh, and uh, this morning. And, you know, something kind of occurred to me while I was reading this, uh, this comic – I mean, our listeners can probably guess what it was. It was Star Wars. And so, um, <laughs> you know. <gasps> Shock. I know, right? So I was I was reading this, and something occurred to me that there is some magic going on behind the scenes, right? It's more than just drawing pictures. Have you noticed this, Blake? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think drawing pictures has got to be maybe the jumping off point, but there is so much that seems to go into each comic book that people make. Right. So as I was reading this, one of my, so I was talking with Woodrow and I was telling him, you know, one of my big hangups about starting comics and getting into comic books and all the graphic novels and stuff when I was younger was how do I know which pain to read next? And how do I juggle looking at the image and reading the text, right? It was so much for my young mind to comprehend. But as I was visiting this comic book last night, I was going through and I said, oh, wow, this this artist has gone through and UXed the shit out of this pain. Like, they organize the pains in just the right way to carry your eye from one scene to the next to where you are not even thinking about where to go next, you just know. And it was really impressive to me. It was really impressive to me to actually see this thing and go, okay, I'm no longer intimidated because the artist is making this like like UX, right? They are they are literally taking this and anticipating my next move and sort of incorporating not only the art but the design of where the chat bubbles are in relation to what's going on in the panes and how, you know, I'm going to approach this. And it was really, really fascinating. Like I stopped reading about halfway through because I was so blown away by this concept. Right, man. I w- it was crazy to me. It is amazing. Cause I, I remember like getting back into comic books when I was like in my late twenties or whatever, and still was, kind of concerned like okay so these are cool the art is great but same concern you had like a lot of the times i don't really feel like it's a very immersive story like a book would be that kind of surrounds you with like a lot of detail and words and like trying to balance between the two is tough but i've had the same experience that you've had reading a lot of different comics these days um in that even within like a single image the way that the text is laid out makes sense either how you visually scan it is is picking up exactly in the right way or it's just how it's all laid out together i don't know there's there's almost this very immersive feeling when you read a comic book now that it's um i don't know just the layout of it the art and the writing behind it is all comes together so well i agree i agree so i went online to check to see if this was analogous online like if i was looking at a computer would this whole thing kind of kind of carry over right and and i found uh the guided view on marvel have you used this no i haven't what is it so the guided view actually hides every pane except for the one that you're currently reading and it's really cool so like if there's a pane that spans the whole page it'll like kind of zoom in on the text and just like the person who's saying it and then it'll zoom out to the whole page it's all it's very cinematic the way it, it happens right 
So obviously I was watching Star Wars stuff and uh, and you know as I was going through this I felt like it was a movie where I was just seeing flashes of the movie go through and it was it was phenomenal man like just put on some John Williams and you're good to go like it was it was really impressive to see so somebody had to actually go in and code where it zooms in on next down to the um sort of the selection box right what do you see and then uh, how does it transition to the next one? It's really cool, and I recommend any of our listeners go check it out because it was awesome. Yeah, I'll have to check out the Marvel Guided View then, because uh, I've been—I don't know—I've been hesitant to really use any of the online comic stuff, but that sounds pretty amazing. Nah, man, they—they they break it down frame by frame, so you're never like you're like look, look. So sometimes there's a spoiler on the very next page, and good artists will hide that on the following page. So as soon as you turn the page, you get it, right? But some kind of put it on page two of the, you know, two-page spread, and you see it, your eyes glance over. But if you're in guided view, man, it is it is awesome because you can't look ahead and get spoiled just by what's on the page. It is pretty great. And uh, kudos to the people over at Marvel who thought of that because that just made it so much more enjoyable for me. That's so awesome. It sounds like they've done like a lot of thought into it as well. So that's that's super cool to hear. Yeah. I'm always stoked to see where artistry and UX and and kind of keeping the reader slash listener in mind. It's always it's always good for me. All right, man. Are you ready to get into Human Factors News? Oh, you know I am. Okay, let's do it. Let's get into Human Factors News. This is the part of the show all about human factors. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence. I have a whole list of stuff, but we're not going to go through it all. You name it, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, so up first this week, so last December, Hyundai announced that they were working towards making cheaper exoskeleton suits. So along with this announcement, researchers at a startup company called BioInc Laboratories began working with machine learning to make exoskeletons more accessible for people with mobility issues. The startup added Amazon's Alexa to its ARC lower body exoskeleton, allowing wearers to control the suit with their voice. The exoskeleton is mainly aimed at those who have suffered spinal injuries, although its lower body support mechanism could also aid stroke and traumatic brain injury victims, claims the company. So for the... For now, this exoskeleton is just a prototype, but the integration of voice activation into exoskeleton technology is very promising. So, Nick, this is definitely an excellent pairing of, of course, voice tech, because you see a lot of that in the news, especially in like UX designer news with voice UIs. Um, But there is a catch that the article does mention with using Alexa, and that's that the functionality uh, with the pairing of Alexa with the exoskeleton only works if you're in range of an Amazon Echo. So it's a little bit limited. You're absolutely right. And I want to bring up two points. So one, yes, it only works if it's within like the same Wi-Fi range of an Amazon Echo. Thankfully, Amazon just announced, I, I didn't put this in their stories because it's not human factors related, but they just announced that they're going to send out their or they just gave permission, basically, for any third party to use their Amazon Web Services with Alexa, right? So, so eventually, Alexa could be built in, built into this exosuit. Okay, that's point one. Point two, I put this in our show notes this week because why the hell do you even need to ask Alexa or tell Alexa that you're ready to do something? The exosuit should just do it. It should know what your intent is based on your body movement. Yeah, and I mean, I'm assuming because it's, this is talking about spinal injuries, this is maybe you don't have access to the lower extremities because this is specifically for this version called the ARC, the lower body exoskeleton. So maybe that was the idea. Because if you think about it, you might have to have more, I don't know, a more evasive exoskeleton to maybe, I guess, grab any sort of brain activity related to that area of your body. So maybe that was their idea. Like if you just use voice, then it'll start moving. Um, So that's a good point for sure. I mean, Um, look, that's a fair, that's a fair assessment, but look, so here's the thing. Our bodies do something really unique when we go to, when we go to get up, Blake, are you sitting down right now? I am standing. Okay. So I, I want you to sit down or pretend like you're sitting down and then pretend like you're going to get up. What happens? I get up. 
Okay, so what is <laughs> what is happening behind the scenes, though, is you are leaning forward to get up out of your seat, right? So there could be pattern recognition. So if you were to lean forward, your exoskeleton would be, oh, they're trying to get up right now because that's not an action that you would normally take while you're sitting on the couch watching TV or sitting in a seat eating breakfast or whatever. You're only doing that. There's a specific motion involved with trying to get up from a chair. You lean forward so that way your center of gravity is a little bit over the front of the chair so that way your body kind of pushes you up and I feel like you could build this pattern recognition into something like this where it will automatically recognize what you're trying to do based on your body movement. I don't know. I Maybe that's like too future looking, but that's where we're going, obviously, is that the exos- exoskeleton will soon know your intent just by you thinking it or by your movements. Yeah, because, I mean, we've gone over stories where it's basically – if you put a, a cap on with squids that can hit certain brain areas of activation, I mean, that's that's enough to tell you that, okay, this person wants to move up. Or like you're talking about, just building sensors in somewhere that can, you know, sense any kind of slight movements like leaning forward or maybe if it's if later on this was to do with arms, if you were like reaching your shoulder in a certain direction to grab something. Um, I think the only part about this that maybe it makes sense is still the fact that it might be for spinal injuries and who knows how much functionality people have um, from lower down. Maybe they can't even move forward. That's Maybe that's like part of how the exoskeleton is working is helping them get that forward momentum to actually stand. Um, Again, I think this is something you and I would have to see in action um, actually moving around uh, to really get a sense of how it was going. And I mean, this is just a prototype, but I I have to agree with you. I think it's a bit strange that for something that's probably pretty expensive because exoskeletons are not cheap, that they put voice activation in there that's so limited um, for right now anyway. So it's, it's kind of a strange pairing of technology, but I don't know. Maybe there is utility to it, especially in cases of like severe spinal injury. Yeah, no, I can see it in those, in those cases, right? So, I don't know. I'm I'm fifty fifty on this. Yes, if you if you're not even able to move your spine, then this will be great. Like you have mobility, and you can just tell Alexa, "I want to go to the kitchen," and you literally like walk to the kitchen. But where does that stop? If you if you have a spinal injury that is preventing you from moving your arms and legs, if you're a paraplegic, then in the kitchen, like Alexa, reach forward five inches. Okay. Alexa, grab. Okay, great. Like, there has to be some better interface. And obviously, human brain interface is the pipeline. It's, it's, it's the pipe dream, pipe dream that will, you know, allow this continuous conversation between the human and the exos, exoskeleton. But it's, it's a long way off. So this is, I guess, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm very skeptical about this. Yeah, and I agree with your skepticism for sure. I, especially since they want to use it with something so specific and in like more of an aid type of uh, area, I still think either going like getting away from the voice and moving towards like adding a cap to the very like a a hat that somebody puts on that can measure some of the brain activity to give you ideas of what the person's trying to do is a better better use of the resources of the startup than trying to go into this this voice realm where I, I think you're right. I mean, imagine, okay, somebody can get up, somebody can do basic movements, but what, what do they do when it comes down to like actually maybe cooking in the kitchen if that's what they're trying to do or even just going to get a glass of water, water things like that. I mean, you're, you're totally right. These fine movements would be really hard to, I guess, voice direct a exoskeleton to do I think. Yeah, I yeah. I'm right there with you. So, I mean, the next step obviously is to put Alexa in this exoskeleton. So, it's not necessarily limited to an area where you have an Amazon Echo or an Amazon Dot. It would be kind of integrating that service and maybe putting it on a Wi-Fi network or a or a 4G network where they actually have access no matter where they're at. They can just kind of beam it beam it to the cloud and then the uh the command comes back to the exoskeleton to where they're ready to roll for whatever they're trying to do. Yeah, man. I mean, that sounds like the way to go for sure. All right. You ready for the next one? All right. Let's move on, shall we? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. 
Okay, so getting into the law a little bit. So Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and even Snapchat are are urging the Supreme Court to set new limits on the ways law enforcement can obtain a suspect's smartphone location data. This all stems from a 2011 investigation of Carpenter versus the United States into a series of robberies in Detroit. In this case, law enforcement officials obtained information from nearby cell towers to determine the whereabouts of one of the suspects without first obtaining a warrant. The Supreme Court considers the matter considers the matter questioning whether law enforcement must be issued a warrant before seeking location data, and tech giants are arguing for the need of greater Fourth Amendment safeguards, such as, quote, ensure that the law realistically engages the, with internet-based technologies and with people's expectations of privacy in their digital data. But, so most Americans, myself included, presume that such requests from law enforcement, law enforcement already require a warrant. And this last part really surprised me. I mean, and one thing I want to say before I move on, uh, it is mentioned in the article that clearly these tech giants don't have any favor about the outcome of this particular case. They're more worried about like safeguards for your actual data. Of course, this was used in definitely, it seems like a good manner trying to get behind, get to the end of robberies in Detroit, but they're more worried about larger implications on a bigger scale. Maybe if it's in different situations where it might be dangerous for you. Um, So Nick, did you know that you could have your uh, location data queried without a warrant behind it? I did, and you know, I'm I'm really a fan of this article. Now, how does this relate to human factors? Well, let me tell you that our devices, our personal devices, our phones, our tablets, whatever, they are becoming slowly but surely a part of us. They are almost an extension of our self. And kind of on that same token, the data collected by these devices while we're out doing things is also ours, right? It, presumably, presumably, it should be, at least, according to this article. And I, I completely agree with it. I think it's an interesting concept because you have to sort of reconcile, yes, you are using a network, you have data available that may or may not incriminate you, but... It's almost the same thing. Like if you have something in your house that may incriminate you, like they have to have a warrant to get to that. Right. So this makes sense to me that in order to in order to protect the innocent, you must protect the guilty. And I think this is one of those examples where they just can't come barging in and steal all the information about you. Yeah, I it's a really tough article, right? Because I mean, even in the court cases being presented, it was used for in a way that seems like it was for the greater good. But at the end of the day, I mean, if, if anybody or not just anybody, I mean, law enforcement specifically can get any information, any data information that you have. I mean, this is just talking about location data um, based off of cell towers, but where does the line draw the enemy? Is it only location about where somebody is? Is it something you, you wrote on your phone is something you posted on Facebook? I mean, how, how much can they, or can't they use? And I really think that it's, it's a, it's a tough spot, but we definitely want to provide rights for people that they're not afraid of how their data is going to be used against them potentially. Um, oh Yeah. Be- because I, I definitely agree with you, and I, I would even go as far to say is my phone has become an extension of me, right? Because I, I offload so much of what I think or what I'm doing. If I come up with ideas, I write it in my phone, I post stuff on Twitter, I have all of my contacts in there. I mean, it's constantly gathering location data of all the places I go. and is a ubiquitous um, tool that all of us use. Like, yeah, it's it's. It, but I mean, yeah, you're right. Where does it stop? Right? Does then my search history? Do you have to have a warrant for my search history? Like, do you have to have a warrant to access my Facebook profile to see who I'm friends with? Like, all these things are. It's it's an interesting case because it opens up this whole can of worms. Where where does it start and where does it end? Right? Because your digital self is an extension of your physical self, and the way you represent yourself online is uh as it stands right now there's a lot of you know <laughs> cooks in the kitchen so to speak 
like my ISP can look at my search history. The and and I don't know if I like that, right? Not that I'm searching for anything weird, but still, it's like that's that's a private those queries are mine. I came up with those queries. Why why do you get to see that? And then more importantly, I want those protected, right? So if I think of a if I think of a novel idea for a paper or an experiment or something, right? And I Google it to see if it happens, then that data is then transferred to whoever's search engine I just searched through and they have access to that idea. And that bothers sure. me. That bothers me, right? So I have to think about roundabout ways to think, okay, what's a good way to ask this question without asking this explicit question to give anybody else ideas? And yes, they get a ton of data. They get a ton of data, right, every day. Everyone's searching for everything all the time. But that doesn't stop the fact that they have access to exactly what I searched. And if if they picked up and said, oh, this guy has some good ideas, let's go ahead and put it through our research to, uh wing you know then it's like well that's that was my idea and how do i prove that yeah and i mean to take it a step further and this goes a little bit deep but we're we're at the point where i where i think i mean we're talking about the phone being an extension of ourselves, really and what rules govern the things that you you search for that you put in your phone that the the data that it carries all that stuff well I mean, Nick, you and I talk a lot about the cutting edge of technology on this show as it relates to human factors. Well, brain, um, brain computer interfaces is a big one. And I mean, what happens then when it starts getting into oh, yeah. all of your thoughts are being recorded? Then, then what, how do the rules change? And I think it's important now to set that precedent and set the, the boundaries so people understand kind of what can or can't be used against them. Because if we have assumptions about... Uh, about what our data can be used for, how it can be used against us, and that's not true. I mean, like you said, you you wouldn't put that idea out into the world for other people to find. Um, yeah, it, I don't know. It changes how we would interact with the technology that we have. And you do bring up a good point about HBIs. Like, if I do think a thought, and that's my original thought, and it's out there, right? Or or like, what if I just have one of these fleeting thoughts that I'd never act on, right? Like everyone has that thought when you're standing on the edge of a tall building or a, or the Grand Canyon or something. You're like, what if I jumped, right? Yeah, we play out the we play out ridiculous scenarios in our heads. I mean, I mean that's a that's like a human thing, right? This you, goes, yeah. You almost overestimate the overestimate fear and overestimate what well maybe what would happen in this situation or play out different scenarios. So, yeah, how does that get used? Or is it just thrown away because it's labeled as just fleeting thought? I don't right. know. Right, yeah. It goes back to classic Freud, like him or not. Like the id ego, super ego. Like, right, you know? <laughs> like, how no, do you, yeah, how do you right. categorize those and what's the legality around them? It's, it's an insane thing to even try to comprehend at this point. But, yes, you're right. Like, setting this precedent right now, trying to get some idea of what, we can and can't use from people. It's it's going to be interesting. The more we integrate with uh, technology, and the more and more our thoughts and uh, data get out there, right? Yeah, it's it's crazy to me. Oh, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, that's kind of why, or the connection I started to draw reading the article to human factors is we're trying a lot of times with human factors work. We try and lay out some kind of for lack of a better word, layout for an interface or infrastructure about how data data is going to work like information architecture. Well, this is kind of a similar thing, but how our data collected is going to be used, who has access access to it in what cases. Like it's uh it'll I think it'll be an ongoing like definition that we'll have to add stuff to, in this case, our own laws and maybe even constitutional amendments and things like that. So it should be interesting to see over the next like ten to fifteen years. For sure. All right. Well, are you? Do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Uh, no. I think that's we've covered it pretty much. Yeah, we beat the dead horse. All right. I just want to thank you, all of our friends over at Engadget, Recode, and IEEE Spectrum for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along with the stories as we find them, you can follow us on social media all over our platforms: Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We're always posting those links to the original articles as we find them. So please, please, please go check those out and follow us because we love you. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? Oh, we do love you guys. And we're
case, it's about automakers. So lawmakers have cautiously supported automaker automakers experiments with self-driving vehicles, but they've been split on whether cars need a steering wheel at all times in case a human has to intervene. However, more and more design concepts are ditching control elements, including wheels, pedals, gear shifts, everything you normally associate with a car. So it's likely a matter of time before wholly autonomous vehicle options head to consumers. However, in the meantime, Ford has filed a patent that splits the difference, having a steering wheel and pedals that are completely removable. While this is only a patent, it shows that automakers are thinking hard about steering and control compromises that will let them sell autonomous vehicles in countries with different legal requirements, along with users who might just want to take the wheel from time to time. This this absolutely blows my mind, the idea of a car without a steering wheel, because I love to drive my car, and I would still like a little bit of an autonomous ride every once in a while, but... I can't imagine a car without a steering wheel, much less without pedals. See, for me, it's the other way around. Like, I would love everything to be autonomous, and then I would love to drive from now and then. Like, yeah, the the thing with this article is that there is there's a lot of questions regarding who is responsible if one of these autonomous vehicles gets into an accident or, you know, uh, I don't want to say it, but take somebody's life, right? So... Who is responsible? Is it the person who designed the automation? Is it the team that designed the automation? Is it the company? Is it the person who was in the car but had no control over it? And I think this is one more way that they're offloading that responsibility from the companies that are designing the automation to say, hey, look, there's stuff there. And in a pinch, you can throw it on and be ready to go. But, you know, keeping the human in the loop is such a huge issue. I don't know, man. Like, I I love that they are designing for a wide variety of different legalities, right? So they're saying, you know, in one country, the law could be you need a steering wheel and pedals. And then in another country, you don't need that stuff. So you can just take it off and leave it in the trunk or whatever, you know? I This is a really interesting problem to me. Yeah, so I agree, and I really love this article because I feel like automakers are really pushing the innovation envelope here. I mean, they're they're completely rethinking how a car is going to be done. I mean, the article even mentions they're taking out control elements, including like gear shifts and pedals. And this one's got them as like modular pieces as far as the steering wheel and the pedals. And I think I I agree with you. It's it's interesting that that's the case, and maybe it is kind of like a legal purview, but it's in the human in the loop uh, situation, trying to reattach a steering wheel and pedals, it's probably too late. Oh, I agree. I agree. That point. But if, you know, if the automaker or whoever is being accused of this says, oh, no, but they had, they totally had the option to, if they followed our directions and kept it, you know, equipped, it was the user's problem for unequipping this stuff like you know they can they can find ways around it by putting it in their end user license agreement or something that says you should keep all these equipped in case of an accident or something uh we are not responsible right so i'm just wondering a giant sticker on the steering wheel that says that (laughs) yeah exactly right so that's where i'm saying where these are great ideas and eventually down the line when all cars are autonomous this will make sense but in the near yeah. future, there's going to be this whole integration piece of, of how does technology interface with other technology that is human-driven versus computer-driven, literally driven, right? And and how who's at fault? And I think, to me, this is just one, one more way of them saying, yeah, this is a good strategy for us to not take the blame for this. Yeah, and I think part of what we have to keep in mind is this is this is like a patent idea. Companies like Ford probably come out with 100 patent ideas that never see the light of the day. They just put the patent on it because they think it's a good idea. Probably. Um, so that you're might right. be the case. But also something else to keep in mind that I think you're really hitting on well is that we've got a long way to go before every car is autonomous. And so it almost seems like it's that in and of itself is kind of going to slow how cars or the evolution of the car. Cause it's gonna you're going to have to have some of the same controls that we do now, because if, 
if you get in a situation where the AI doesn't know what to do or anything like that, you've got to have the option to, at least from a, a vehicle maker perspective and probably an AI um, algorithm perspective, that the human can jump in, take control, and have some like fault in the in any kind of like accident or anything like that. And the other thing I want to mention, I mean, we're still in the stages of lawmakers even like approving everywhere that these cars can be tested on the road. So we're, we're, we're not probably very far away from having a lot of these cars deployed fully where people are driving them on their own, but, or being self-driven on their own, I guess. Um, but we're still in the experimental stages of all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see where it goes for sure. I, I, I don't know. I I hate to be cynical around this stuff because I feel like we come off more cynical than not. But these are important issues to think about. And and uh, I I commend Ford for coming up with something that's outside the box that, oh, yeah, it's modular and you can equip them or not. And uh, it, it allows for more user customization, which is I'm always a proponent of like. I don't know. I have an Android and you know how customizable things, those things are. But like, if you could (laughs) imagine if you could make it, you know, an automatic just by taking off the shift gear or, uh, you know, it it, it depends. You can adjust the level of automation, so to speak, if you put in different modules. I don't know. I'm thinking outside the box here, but um, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Uh, The only other closing thought I have is I think it's a great design challenge for like, how do we, design the safety features in these new age kind of cars that people are making. I mean, so with the steer- steering wheel being able to be removed, the article mentions like a big problem then is where you put the airbag. Oh yeah, that's, that's right. That's typically where that is and it's stopping that forward impact. So I think it, it gives people like interior designers of cars as well as human factors, engineers or scientists, a lot of things to think about in terms of how these are being built with safety features in mind, but also like how people interact with the car. Cause, um, the, the article even mentioned something about putting the, taking the dashboard away or so how do people actually like interact with any controls or change anything in the, in the car. So, cause without a steering wheel, you're kind of just hanging out, sitting there. So where does all the, the like kind of interfaces we know in a car go? Um, so a lot of cool design challenges. for Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking of design challenges, I want to hear what our listeners have to say. If you guys think, you know, how to solve this autonomous vehicle problem, tweet at us. Let us know. <laughs> hashtag Human Factors Cast or hashtag HF Cast. We will get to those next week. <laughs> so if you have an excellent novel idea, we'll cover it on the show and we'll give it a, we'll give it a listen and a talk, I guess, because we're not listening to your tweets. We're reading them and then talking about them. All right. I've gone on too much. <laughs> Blake. <laughs> Uh, it's now been a Monday. To tweets. Okay. <laughs> Let's go on. What's it got next? <laughs> All right. So move over autonomous cars. There's a new vehicle making waves in Singapore and Japan, and it is the self-driving wheelchair. So the Singapore MIT Alliance for Research and Technology, otherwise, otherwise known as SMART, developed a self-driving wheelchair that's been deployed in a local hospital. So the wheelchair uses data from three light detection and raging sensors to make a map, and with a localization algorithm, it can help determine where it is location-wise. The chair's six wheels lend stability, and the chair is designed to make tight turns and fit through normal-sized door frames. A second wheelchair, designed by Panasonic and Wilco, Will Incorporated, made its debut in the Tokyo airport. So in addition to also being an autonomous wheelchair, this wheelchair incorporates automation tech that was developed for a hospital delivery robot. The wheelchair actually identifies its position, selects routes, and moves to a chosen destination based on user input into a smartphone. Both of these amazing companies' wheelchairs are currently only in test phase, but hopefully will be deployed over the coming months. So all of this kind of, I don't know, cynical talk about automated vehicles I am super happy and super excited about automated wheelchairs like this because I think this is a great, I think both applications of being in a hospital setting and in an airport setting are awesome. So, Blake, I want to hit two points really quick before I get into this article. One, oh, God. Sounds one, like serious voice. We're in trouble. It is. So, Blake, first off, that was an amazing segue. Autonomous cars move aside. And second, <laughs> second, you put together the show notes this week, and I'm always harping on you for putting some sort of downer as the last story. This is a good choice, man. <laughs> oh, just the last story? Oh, yes. <laughs> I did end it on a positive note. Yeah, See, you did. 
That was I good. I tend to listen. Yeah, no, this is great. I, I am a huge proponent of accessibility and trying to get people who couldn't get to one place to another to get to one place to another. Wow, that was so eloquent. Uh, but <laughs> you get the point, right? Like, we need... The, the more people who are getting from point A to point B, the better. Because you are no longer keeping them in the same place and that makes sense yeah because if they're moving they're not in the same place (laughs) help me out here blake (laughs) okay so uh, this is the best story of the week by far but i just had a thought about having a wheelchair that's automated in the airport now i don't know when the last time you went to a really busy airport was, but I was recently (laughs) in Newark airport and I can only imagine this thing having to just, you know, take the most rigid and crazy turns, especially since it's using like LIDAR sensors Mm -hmm. to try and locate itself. And then all of a sudden seeing people like running around this side, the other side. So I think maybe infrastructure wise, we might need specific lanes for these things to travel down. I was going to try to navigate a bunch of people. It's got to be tough. Oh, yeah, yeah. And like you said, I think the lanes are the way to go. But the fact that they are able to, you know, uh, the fact that it's even in an airport to begin with, that is a huge barrier from getting from your vehicle to the airplane and then getting to wherever you're going and then getting off that airplane and getting to a car. Like, that takes care of this whole accessibility mobility issue, right? And, And that is awesome. People who were bedridden before, or chair-ridden, rather, can see the world, and that is awesome. They can go to uh, they can go to the USA and, and see the total eclipse, right? And and uh, and it'll it'll be a good time. <laughs> <laughs> we are off the rails, Blake. Bring it back. Okay, so one thing to mention. Okay, okay, sorry. Especially, <laughs> I was really impressed with the uh, the smart team that deployed the robot in Singapore because it was obvious from the article that they had actually gone out and done some serious user research, like at least visiting old folks' homes and trying to determine, like, hey, it's really important for these people to get around and be mobile and really be able to travel or go places or even like just get around the airport and not necessarily need somebody pushing them around. Like this gives them some more quality of life back. And I thought that was a really great thing to see that a team's actually going out and trying to see what's going on in these older populations to determine what's going to like give them some quality of life back. I thought that was just a a awesome part of the article. Yeah. Yeah. That, that independence uh, has got to be great. Like I remember when I had my appendix removed, like just even just that, that like five day streak where I was in the hospital and at home, it was miserable not being able to do anything or go out and see, like if I had a wheelchair to get me out there and, and do things that I needed to do, that'd be awesome. And this is just that first step into that world okay blake are you ready to tackle the it came from reddit section this week i'm so excited for it came from reddit oh man let's get it so we have been uh we have been neglecting it came from reddit for twitter a couple weeks (laughs) i just i love this keeps coming i know i know i keep playing it anyway we have been we've been uh tackling twitter so we're going to switch gears and get to It Came From Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics. I'm sorry, guys. Can you tell I'm excited about the eclipse? Uh, from all over the community and what they are talking about, any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among our community. So which one do you want to tackle, Blake? Because I think we're running tight on time here. We got about 10 minutes, and uh, we got four questions that we may want to address. So maybe oh, two. I didn't even know we had four. Oh, man. Um, you know, Nick, I'm gonna need some guidance on this, on which one do you want to tackle? Cause I was oh. ready to tackle them all. Oh boy. All right. Uh, let's go with one and oh, uh, four, one and four. Do those sound good to you? Beautiful. Let's get it. Okay. All right. So our first, it came from, and if we, if we have time, we'll get to other ones. Uh, <laughs> today's entry was found on the user experience side of Reddit by, oh, I'm going to butcher this really bad, GD Oikers. GD, G Doikers. You did better than I would have, All man. right. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> All right, and it is titled, How to Improve User Experience. 
G. Doy Cares writes, I have a point of sale, an inventory system app, the ones that you see on cash on the cashier when you get your groceries and check out the items, the software used on those cash registers. I have no firsthand experiences uh, in improving UX and UI because I don't have users or audience to test them out. Any feedback is appreciated. And they provide a link to their web app and uh, a username and password. Blake, have you ever worked retail? Uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, I've, I'm familiar with with the cash register system, um, but not anything that had like a UI to it. I mean, I used to work at a delivery sandwich shop, so I had to run the cash register. But no, no specific like retail. How about you? Oh, man. So I have a comp. I wouldn't say comprehensive. I have a varied retail experience. And some of these point of sale systems are awful when it comes to usability for the cashiers. And, um, you know, when I was um, trying to think of how much I should say, I when I worked at a luxury handbag designer store. What that, up? That's yeah. that's pretty ambiguous. When I worked at a luxury handbag designer store, <laughs> I uh, they did an interesting thing where they they had this new concept where you had a mobile point of sale. And um, what they did was they loaded up their point of sale system on an iPod and, uh, you know, equipped it with a card reader and sent it out to every to a couple stores in the fleet as like a, like a usability test. Right. And cool. so the, the users could actually provide feedback that way. So now I understand that not everyone has access to that, but there are a few things that you can do as a designer um, of one of these programs that will sort of help out, right? So you can obviously do the usability heuristics. Um, if you have access to anyone, even, even uh, you know what? Yeah, if you have access to anyone, even going into a shopping store of whatever you're doing and seeing how they do it now, that's research right there. And, uh, you know, just seeing how not only the customer goes from point A to point B, grabbing an item off the shelf and leaving, but how the cashier takes the item, rings the item, and paying attention to all the stuff that they have to do in between, like uh, having a conversation with the person um, to facilitate you know, a good customer experience and, and to really tailor to those customer needs. There's a lot of things that go on that I, I swear, man, like everyone should go through in high school a retail appreciation class kind of like home economics or uh, PE right I think this is one of those things that people should just because there are some really entitled people who think that retail workers are the lowest of the low and kind of uh, you know they don't deserve what they're getting paid and all that stuff but man they have it rough because they have to deal with people yelling and screaming at them all day because something's not right and uh, if you can go in and kind of observe that and say, wow, I really need to make this easy for the cashier to do this. Uh, that's that's a huge selling point. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, you, you're hitting the nail right on the head. They have a hard enough job as, as it is. You never really know how a customer is going to act, what what kind of day they've had, how if they're going to take it out on you as a person. So the least they could do to make their their lives as a cashier or a retailer easier is to have a system that makes you able to check people out quickly and get things done. Um, so I, like you, would also recommend, I mean, especially if this is an already developed product, I would have like two or more people run and just do like a UX audit. So do a heuristic evaluation, have them compare across each other and really give you some hard recommendations about anything from information architecture to just basic small design tweaks that you could make. Uh, to make the experience a little smoother. Um, and I totally appreciate that you don't, if you don't have any specific users you can test this with, but from the start, I mean, I would have gone out like Dick said, and if, if there was a target market for this particular point of sale system, like if it was, uh, you mentioned grocery stores. So if it was grocery stores, I mean, I'd go ask a handful of cashiers across the stores you were targeting like, what are the biggest pain points in the system they have now? Oh, yeah. What would improve it? That kind of stuff. Just to give you a baseline or even to make sure, like, you're not repeating the same mistakes of uh, systems that have already been deployed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything you can do for those poor cashiers out there because I feel for them. Holy moly. All right. Oh, 100%. <sighs> um, so you want to tackle four, yeah? Let's do it. I kind of want to tackle three now. You do? All right. Let's do three. 
Okay, all right. Let's well, let's tackle three and then maybe four. You know what? I feel right. like we've teased our audience enough. All right, let's do it. Uh, so today, uh, the second entry was found from the user experience subreddit by TBE0027, uh, titled "The Best Mockup Wireframe Tools." They write. Uh, I am currently on my computer science course's user interface design module, and the teacher asked me to find a nice, free screen mock-up making tool. And right now, I'm kind of short of options. We've been using Proto.io. Have you heard of that one, Blake? Yeah, I have. I've used it a little bit. Okay. They've been using that for the last week, but the trial period has ended, and we kind of need another one ASAP. Since the tests are about to start, any suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Thanks in advance. All right. Blake. Proto.io, you've used this. It's not free, apparently, because the free trial's over. Yeah, and it's it's tough. I would want to know like how long somebody wants to use this for. Um, but kind of I've got like two pretty good suggestions, or maybe three. Um, so if you really need the fidelity of something like proto.io, I would go for one called Just in Mind. It's justinmind.com. It's very similar. I mean, you can you can do basic interactions. Um, it's got, it's got some like presets. So if you're doing mobile design, it's got enough presets that it'll get you started. If you're doing specific web size design it'll it has that too already built in. So it's, it's, it's very similar to proto dot proto dot IO or sketch. Um, so that's a great one. I had it on my work computer for a while and used it every once and again. Um, I think if you want any of like the really intensive features, as far as animations, you're going to have to pay for it. But as far as just getting something to get you going, for free, justinmind.com should help you. Uh, we're not sponsored by them or anything. That's just one that I found earlier that I remember I used. This episode of Human Factors Cast brought to you by justinmind.com. If you go to one justinmind.com. <laughs> okay, no, I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Blake. Um, okay, so the other thing I, I saw in an article that I was reading this morning, and I don't know if anybody subscribes to this newsletter or not, but somewhere I go for a lot of like UX content as far as like news and uh, resources is uxdesign.cc and so the curator of that like it's gotten to be really big over the past couple of years but the curator of it he did an interview and what he talks about that he uses the most is actually totally free and shareable and that's just google slides um so that's a, that's another one if you don't oh. need something super high tech uh that's a, that's another way you can go um, but again you're not going to get you have to do a little bit more work like using something like that. It's not going to have as many presets for you or any of that kind of stuff. So that's, you said that's you, my two cents. You said you had three. That was two, right? Um, yeah. Uh, there's another one called Envision. I know they have a longer trial period. Um, I can't, That one's I left at the end because it's good. It's similar to Proto.io, but again, you're you're signing up for a trial. I don't know how long your class is, if you need to use this for an entire semester. If that's the case, I would assume that <laughs> the course would help you with that. Um, but actually, the, I have a fourth. This is the last one, I swear. Uh, if you're a student, it used to be the case that Azure had a either a oh, severe yeah. discount or they give it to you for free, and it was their biggest or their most up-to-date license. So check out Azure. Yeah. So, okay. Are you ready to get into mine? Because people always laugh when I when I suggest these, but I I stand by them, man. Let's do it. What do you got? All right. So uh, there's a little program uh, called Microsoft PowerPoint, and yes, I know this isn't free, but if you're a student, chances are you have um, access to it at least, you know, in the computer labs or whatever. It's one of those widely accessible programs that a lot of people overlook as a prototyping tool. So if you if you need to, um, I mean, you're looking for a screen mock-up making tool. PowerPoint has a lot of built-in shapes and you can customize it. And look, I know it's low fidelity. That's that's okay. You're just trying to get across a concept, right? Unless you're trying to do that high fidelity stuff, then I don't know. Okay, so if Microsoft PowerPoint doesn't work for you for one reason or another, um, be it you don't have a license for it, it's not available at your campus, um, there's OpenOffice, which has a free version of Microsoft PowerPoint, probably has a lot of the same tools. I haven't actually used it personally, but I do know that OpenOffice is pretty good about staying analogous to, um, you know, the Microsoft Office tool set. And I, I would assume that there's a lot of uh, similar tools in there that you could use as a, as a prototyping screen mock-up making tool. 
I think you were. I I don't know. I would go with Microsoft PowerPoint or Google SlideShare to be honest, because yeah, especially if you're okay. I'm like making leaps and bounds here, but if you're in a computer science course, I'm assuming you're making mockups and then you're gonna either code or get really close to writing what these interfaces are actually going to look like with specific types of technology. So, I mean, I would even recommend starting with paper, then moving to like Microsoft PowerPoint oh, yeah. to polish it and then, and then go code right in CSS or HTML. I mean, if this, especially if this is a computer science course. Um, but that's, that's just my two cents. All right, man, we are running short on time. We just hit the hour mark, but I want to make sure we get to question four. So, this last one is from Jason Silverman, Silberman, uh, titled Your Best Experience with User Slash Customer Surveys. He asks, uh, what is your preferred survey app? What do you use surveys for? Where have you found them the most valuable in terms of user experience? Blake, I'm going to have you go first on this one. All right. So the one I've used most recently, or there's two of them. So I've used definitely SurveyMonkey because uh, the organization that I work for, the nonprofit, is UXPLA. Uh, we do all of our surveys through them, and that's typically trying to get uh, demographics about the people that, that are a part of our group, trying to really use them to target the events that we have. Like We notice that we have a lot more people that are not so junior in the user experience community in LA. They're much more like mid-level to senior, and we notice that from their responses to surveys, either from open-ended questions or just general, like, where, where do you work, all that kind of stuff, that they want more... Um, more like leadership information in UX. So that's one way we've used surveys. Uh, Google Forms is another one that I've used before, and we use it to basically just throw out to our, our like director's community about what topics do we want to cover for our meeting, what's most important. So we use it as kind of like a, just a gauge. So from getting basic user information to actually just within our own organization, I, we use surveys for all, towards, all sorts of stuff. What do you got, Nick? Yeah, so I want to echo SurveyMonkey and Google Forms. I use those as well. I've also used Qualtrics in the past. They're a little bit more pricey, but if you're a student, uh, you can get away with it, I think. Um, I also used Usability Hub for a couple of my stuff. You can do that for A-B testing and whatnot. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of good tools out there, uh, but SurveyMonkey by far is probably my favorite just because it's it has a free tier and you can use it if you know, you're just doing something independent. Um what do I use them for? I, I typically use these in situations where I need a lot of data really quick. Uh, I don't use it when, you know, I, I need a couple data points because I can just actually go out to users. I have I have the luxury of going out to users or uh, subject matter experts and just kind of ver verifying with them to make sure, you know, that this concept is okay. I don't need to ask a ton of people. Um, but it, it is when I, when like, I know nothing about the domain that I am like, okay, let's see how many people we can blast this out to and what kind of demographic information, like you said, that you use for UXPLA, what kind of demographic information can we get back? What is, what it's like trends that you look for in survey data. Right. And, um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's been really useful at least for me. Uh, I'm, I'm addressing your third question here. What what have you found them to be? Uh, what have you found them the most valuable in terms of user experience? I find them really efficient and valuable for persona development. If you ask a demographic questionnaire and blast that out to a million people, you kind of get these groups of aggregates of oh, they're between this age age range. Um, you have this many male, this many female, and uh, you can you can kind of develop your personas based on the um distribution of responses for the uh the demographic information yeah and uh to echo that last point i mean the thing thing i think i found most valuable and this is more like product development specific is especially if we're developing something new or we have an existing prototype and we want to blast out and try and figure out what was or what people liked in like maybe legacy software was using the data we found to find trends for uh, featured features that we wanted to keep in a system or add to a system that people like from disparate places. So that that's another kind of use. Oh yeah. Um, and lastly, like SurveyMonkey is is great for teams because you can build a survey, send it out to your team, and they can edit and comment very much like you would do in let's say like Google Docs. So awesome oh, yeah. collaborative tool too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man, let's pull it out. Let's let's get out of here. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be it for today, everyone. And let us know what you think of the stories this week. 
and the Reddit posts. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you think we missed or that you want us to cover, you can follow us all over social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. We're at H Factors Podcast over there. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling really saucy, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing and want to support us financially, you know we bring these things to you ad-free. Why? Because we love you. You can support us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We got a couple interesting rewards up there. Please go check it out. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes. Sorry, Apple Podcasts. They're no longer called iTunes. The Google Play Store or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And please make those reviews good. We'd like to hear from you. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Garsdorf, thank you for joining me on Eclipse Day. Where can our listeners go and find you? So, we had a great Eclipse Day, and you can find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Excellent. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. I've been posting about the Eclipse all day. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. It depends. Wheelchairs, Alexa! Excellent kill, Dan. Accessibility! It's a trap! Surveys.